Roosevelt, um, and this is his governmental uh, struggles is what we're going to deal with here, is what he tries to propose, what he does propose, what his administration gets accomplished uh, through Congress. So he, uh, he proposes what's called the square deal. You're going to see a lot of deals coming up here in the 20th century. Everybody's got a deal. So his is the square deal. He wants a square deal, a fair deal for everybody. Two goals here. He wants to control corporations, and he wants the government to regulate them as much as possible um, and to break up trust where necessary. He also wants to conserve natural resources, and this would be his big thing. Okay, This is what Teddy Roosevelt's really remembered for, is that uh, conservation of natural resources. So two goals there. First, he has to deal with the coal strike. There's a massive coal strike that takes place in Pennsylvania, affecting about 140,000 immigrant workers. Now, we know that coal mining is a very dangerous job, hugely dangerous, and these guys work really, really long hours. So, what are they asking for? They're asking for better conditions, they're asking for an increase in pay, about 20%, and they're asking for a decrease in hours. They want to go from 10 hours a day to 9 hours a day, so 20% increase, for less time on the job. Well, you can imagine how the, coal, the mine operators felt about this. Uh -uh. They refused to negotiate. The mine owners said, no way. That's ridiculous. We're not even going to sit down at the table and negotiate. So the coal miners walk out on strike. What happens? No coal. Who does that affect? The schools and the hospitals especially need that coal to heat their buildings where large numbers of people gather and necessary for education and for medical, okay? Roosevelt says, ah, no, 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 this can't happen, not on my watch. So I want both sides at the table in the White House, we're breaking this down. And he brings both sides together in the White House to mediate this situation. And what he tells the coal mine owners is, I will take over your mines and I will run them using federal troops if you don't negotiate with these coal miners. So unlike previous presidents who have supported the owners and told the workers, we're going to use federal troops to, to fill your jobs until you guys get your butts back in there, he says to the owners, I'm taking over your operation. Well, that's going to hit them in the pocketbook. So they agree to negotiate, and the result of that is the miners get an increase in pay. They get about a 10% increase in their pay, great raise, and percentage-wise. Um, and they go to a nine-hour workday from a 10-hour workday. So they do get a decrease in the number of hours they have to work and still get a 10% raise. How does he go after corporations? Well, two things. The Elkins Act in 1903 goes after, and both of these go after the railroads, but that one goes after rebates. Anybody who gives a rebate as a railroad operator and anybody who accepts a rebate as a consumer is subject to heavy governmental fines. The Hepburn Act in 1906 goes after the system where the railroads would give out free passes for people to use, those were seen as bribes. And if you were caught doing that, you also got a heavy fine. Now, Teddy Roosevelt was known as a trust buster, even though we would see Taft after him break up more trust than Roosevelt did. Roosevelt did get a nickname of being a trust buster, a reputation. He goes after, in 1902, he goes after Northern Securities Company first. Northern Securities was a railroad conglomerate run by J.P. Morgan and James J. Hill. Um, both of these guys, banking and railroads, coming together. <laughs> Deadly combination. They wanted a monopoly on railroads in the northwest of the country. And the Supreme Court says, no dice, can't do it, and he, or, they order the trust to break up. The, um, Teddy Roosevelt and the Supreme Court are also going to break up the Sugar Trust, the Beef Trust, the Fertilizer, and Harvester Trust as well. Now, he doesn't go after all the trusts because, frankly, he thinks that some of them serve a good purpose in our economy, and he wants that fair and equal uh, competition to exist, so he doesn't go after everybody. He does want to protect the consumer, and um, a lot of things come to light about the beef industry at the time. Uh, Foreign countries who had relied on American beef and cattle had started to refuse American beef because it was some of the stuff coming out of small companies was tainted and was a danger to the beef supply. 
Upton Sinclair, an author, writes a work, a short work, you've probably read it in ninth grade, called The Jungle. Now, The Jungle is an expose on the meatpacking industry. And he, what he does is he goes to Chicago, where a lot of the meatpacking takes place, and he just tells all the gross and horrible stories about the meatpacking industry and what could actually be in your meat. Yikes. I don't want to know. Um, the Meat Inspection Act, upon the publication of this book, the Meat Inspection Act in 1906 is passed, and that says that any meat that is shipped over state lines is subject to inspection from the corral to the can. That means while the cows are and the steer are alive, they can be checked, and all the way through the um, harvesting of that meat the, um, to the packaging of that meat to the distribution of the meat. Corral to the can, the meat can be inspected. If anything's wrong, they can shut a plant down. Pure Food and Drug Act is passed in 1906 as well, and that says that there's not going to be any adulteration or mislabeling of foods. In other words, foods have to be labeled exactly what they are. You can't label something chicken and have it be pork. You can't label something as having um, whole grain in it if it doesn't have whole grain in it. Um, Marlon Moraga, please stop at the guidance office. Marlon Moraga, thank you. Not that um, whole grain was really a big issue in 1906, but the mislabeling of foods was an issue. And pharmaceuticals, drug companies, also had to be careful with their labeling as well um, and make sure things were fair and accurately represented. Now, conservation. Um, this is Teddy Roosevelt's lasting legacy. His most enduring achievement for Teddy Roosevelt is conservation. Three big things here. The Desert Land Act, now none of these, notice, are passed during Teddy Roosevelt's administration, 1847, 1891, 1894. All of them are passed previous to Teddy Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, but he takes advantage of all three of them in putting them to work. They never, previous presidents hadn't really utilized these acts. They had just sort of let them be there and exist, but never had really taken advantage of them. So the Desert Land Act in 1847 says that the government can sell arid land in the West cheaply, but it must be irrigated within three years. So you have to find a water source for it in three years. The Forest Reserve Act in 1891 sets aside public lands, forests, as national parks. Teddy Roosevelt's going to set aside more land for national parks than any president previous to him. Huge in this area. Um, and they set aside 46 million acres of national land for national parks. The, um, Yellowstone is an example of a national park, okay? We, we know this. Um, Cary Act of 1894 gives federal lands to states, but they also have to improve the land, and that means you have to irrigate it and settle it um, within a certain amount of time, okay?